Welcome to Talking Beats with me, Daniel Lalchuk. If you like what you hear, I'd love you to give us a five-star rating on Apple or Spotify. Write a review, and if you're so inclined, tell a friend or family member. They might like the show as much as you do. Be sure to visit our website, talkingbeats.com, where you can find much more information about the guests, support the show in various ways, sign up for the newsletter, and be in touch directly with me. As always, the dialogue continues on social media at Talking Beats Podcast. I'm so glad you're here with me. Now, to the conversation. On today's program, legendary political philosopher Michael Walzer. He has spent decades at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, where he addresses a wide variety of topics in political theory and moral philosophy, including just and unjust wars, nationalism and ethnicity, economic justice, and the welfare state. His books widely referenced around the world include Thick and Thin, Moral Argument, At Home and Abroad, Passion and Politics Toward a More Egalitarian Liberalism, In God's Shadow, Politics in the Hebrew Bible, and Just and Unjust Wars, A Moral Argument with Historical Illustrations. He's writing and thinking incessantly these days about democracy, about broad liberal ideas and ideals, and dangerous paths taken by certain countries in the 20th century. A figure of great distinction. I'm honored to have him here with me. Michael Walzer, welcome. Thank you. It, it's wonderful to be actually talking. <laughs> well, I wish we were in the same room, but you know, uh, in, in place of that, we have this, okay, so the thing hanging over everything right now, American democracy, have you ever seen it in your lifetime or in another time that you've studied in a more perilous state than it is right now? I'm trying to think of what it, what it felt like, not to me, but maybe to my parents, uh, when uh, Nazism was triumphant in um in Europe, and America first was quite powerful here, anti-Semitism rampant. It may have felt worse then. In, the, in my lifetime, in my time of political awareness, this is probably the worst, the most, the most dangerous. It's very hard to understand how so many people um, are taken in by a politics of lies, resentment, nationalist, Christian nationalist fury. It's it's not something that I am familiar with. I don't experience it in my life in Princeton or in uh, in New York. It it is an America that I don't I really don't know. An America you don't know, an America I don't know, but it's it's there. And where was it before? Where was it in the before time? It was was it always there? And it took this particular circumstance to to bring it to the fore, or or, or is is there something else happening? Well, I think that a very large number of the people now uh, who voted for 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 Donald Trump um, were simply not voting. We, we always believed on the, the left, the liberal left, we always believed that the, um, the higher the percentage of Americans voting, the better it was for us. But I'm not sure that is, uh, that is true. There were an awful lot of, of Americans seething with resentment, but not politically engaged. And Trump brought them out in in astonishing numbers. And of course, in 2020, there was a big turnout on the other side, also um, a response to, uh, to Trump. And I guess I still believe that if, if there were a very high turnout among poor Americans and minority Americans, elections would look much better. But it is obviously true that there ha- there is a, a very, very large number of people who were politically alienated 
and uh, Trump has um, has given them a cause. I I can't explain to you exactly how that how that works. And um, it's interesting that you say has in the present tense because he's no longer president. He hasn't been in office uh, for months or going on a year, but. Here you are using the present tense because not a lot has changed, or in fact, maybe things have gotten worse. What, what do you think is what has happened since Trump left the office that you either predicted or didn't predict? <laughs> he, he has captured the Republican Party. When he was president, it was more or less understandable that uh, there would be support in Congress among Republicans for a Republican president. Um, I guess many of us hoped that with Trump in in exile, as it were, in Florida, the the decent Republicans uh, would recapture the the party. The the never Trumpers would make a, a comeback. Um, and clearly, they not only haven't done that, but they are increasingly isolated within the within the party. And I think there are now Republicans who would like to get rid of Trump and replace him with a more, someone who looked better to uh, independent voters, moderate voters, swing voters, but who would have essentially the same politics. Uh, A Trumpism without Trump. I.e. Mr. Youngkin in Virginia. Yes, or DeSantis in uh, Florida. Uh, there are a number of um, of, of uh, people who think of themselves as uh, as as filling that role. Uh, maybe Josh Hawley, maybe even Nikki Haley. I've, I thought of her as a, as a um, a Republican of an, of an older sort, um, quite right wing on social economic issues, but not. Not not committed to the politics of resentment, of um, of fear, of nationalist um, anger, but she has she has somehow I think so far at least reconciled herself to that politics and even tried to represent it in her own in her own way, and that's that's disappointing. Is there a time in history you you mentioned the rise of the Nazis, which is not not a, a, a pretty image to think about but is there is, is there a time in history that or or is that the one where where you where you see such a cult of personality and such a, a wild um dependence and i guess addiction to one person no matter what he says i i, I don't know what people made of andrew jackson <laughs> uh who seems to have been a kind of populist figure and I know that in my family, FDR was was adored, or even I mean, when when he died, it was a day of of terrible anxiousness and and sorrow. But somehow, I don't think I don't think either Jackson or uh, Roosevelt inspired a kind of totally un- uncritical acceptance of every word they said without reference to, without regard for the, the real world. No, I think he, he is a phenomenon. He may have, there may be examples in Europe, but not, uh, I, th- I think not in American history. You wrote in an open letter recently with a, a, a group of Republicans and a group of Democrats, both a joint letter called An Open Letter in Defense of Democracy, it was published on October 27th in both The New Republic and The Bulwark. So I wonder, what prompted this on October 27th? What, is it, why then and not a month from now or on June 27th? Is, what, what is happening that we need to be aware of now that is turning the screws on this or on us? That letter was written by three, three friends of mine, three people I know pretty well, but I, I can't uh, tell you exactly why they chose that moment um, before the election, maybe in fear of what might be coming. I, I think that 
uh, at least on the part of the of a, someone like Bill Crystal, a, a never Trumper, it must be a growing realization of um, that he has he has no political friends in the party where he spent most of his life. And, and he, he needs to find new friends. Um, and these are going to be people, um, liberals, even, even leftists, who are, who are committed to um, not, not just democracy, but to the, the underpinnings of democracy, to uh, the right of opposition, to electoral fairness, to um, free speech. So I think maybe it's just um, the moment has come. Um, all of us are sufficiently afraid that we have to uh, we have to work together. Some some excerpt uh, from the letter reads: "Liberal democracy itself is in danger. Liberal democracy depends on free and fair elections, respect for the rights of others, the rule of law." a commitment to truth and tolerance in our public discourse, all of these are now in serious danger. Did you ever think, Michael Walzer, that you'd be at a point, and we'd be at a point where democracy and the basic tenets, sort of things that, that we take to be true and we assume that everybody believes in, we, I think, assumed with a D that everybody believed in the ability for the more people possible to vote. We believe that once an election was over, it was over. We believe basic things, but apparently that's not true. So did you ever think that you'd be at a point talking about such fundamental issues with such that are in such a delicate place? I never thought that I would um, I would be confronted by very, very large numbers of people for whom the factual world, what what we think of as reality, has no force, who live in a a mythical world of anger and resentment. (laughs) In in your list of, of, um, of things in danger, it's truth above all that worries me uh, the most because when we talk to one another, when we argue with one another, in the past we've always assumed some kind of common factual base. We assume a world that we share and we share a certain knowledge of it. We may interpret some of the knowledge differently, but we share a basic understanding of what reality is. And that that loss is more frightening than any of the others. We are accustomed to pretty violent or rhetorically violent partisanship in American history has been full of incident of efforts at at radical gerrymandering and of efforts to um, exclude um, minorities from voting. We are familiar with campaigns for civil liberty and campaigns um, against discrimination. And uh, truth is, uh, <laughs> is something we always assumed. What were you doing before Trump came along? Obviously, this has probably changed the focus of what you write and what you study. But, but before Trump was president, what were you doing and how radically did his election shift what you wanted to look at? Yes. Well, uh, I think um, uh, there were a large number of people on the the liberal left who thought that we we were approaching um, a new era of, of social democracy. The New Deal is the American version of social democracy. It's a very moderate version. It's um, it's minimalist in many ways compared to, uh, say, Scandinavian social democracy. But it was our our version. Educate us a little bit. What, what exactly do you mean by social democracy or, or our, our light L I T E version? A willingness to use state power in support of a more egalitarian society. 
um, and increasingly now to use state power to deal with uh, the environmental crisis or now to deal with uh, the, um, the health crisis, uh, the pandemic. Uh, social democracy reflects a certain attitude toward collective empowerment and the state as the agency of the collective acting against um, established hierarchies, uh, what used to be called special interests, on behalf of, of the people. And although Obama was a disappointment, um, he turned out not to be a, a lefty of any sort. Uh, nonetheless, his, his election represented the possibility of um, a turn toward it's I, I would call it the near left, not the far left, the near left in American life, which is a, the, a version of welfareism, a version of state action um, for for equality. And now, as I said, uh, for dealing with the uh, the crises of um, of uh, the, the, the global uh, the global crises of our time. Um, what do you mean that Obama turned out not to be left? What what was he? He was a centrist. He was a neoliberal. Of, um, he believed in, um, as Clinton did. These were Democrats who had who had accepted neoliberal economics, which meant the the reform or the uh, curtailment of the welfare state. Um, it meant. Um, accepting the, the decline of the unions. It, it meant um, living with, uh, accommodating corporate America. O o Obama, we, we thought, represented something different. Actually, I think Hillary ran a campaign to the left of Obama in the primaries in 2008. Her view of healthcare was a more radical view. That was one of the defining of features. Uh, she favored a strong mandate for health insurance, and uh, and he did did not. He turned out to be a was a genuine moderate, and very very nervous about moving forward on racial issues. Perhaps because he thought his very election was already a, a, a victory against racism. But it wasn't enough of a, vi of a victory. Do you think he could have done anything differently to provide for a different outcome in the election between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton? I, I, I don't know. I mean, we, we were fooled by the polls, by our own uh, provincial view of America. I think certainly Hillary's campaign could have been, should have been a, a different kind of campaign. She, she walked away, as Bill Clinton had done, from the white working class. She walked away from unemployment in the, in the Rust Belt. She didn't go there and talk about what, what might have been done to revive American manufacturing. I think uh, Biden has a better sense, uh, but it's, it's late. Late. What does late mean? Late in his life or, or late? It's late because the effects of, of neoliberalism, the effects of, of the decline of the unions, the effects of the growing disaffection of, of um, working class Americans, uh, all that has, has, has led to Biden's situation. He, I think he knows what needs to be done. He no longer has a majority um, or if he has a majority in the country, it is not reflected in the political system. He is trying to do what Clinton and Obama should have tried to do during the years. There were a couple. There were years for Clinton and just two years for Obama when they actually had majorities, significant majorities in the House and Senate, um, and they didn't move as fast as they should have. And now, I mean, now it's Biden is inheriting a situation where he doesn't have political power. He has the presidency and he can act through executive orders, some of which the courts will allow and many of which they probably won't. 
but in Congress, uh, the forces of good, the forces of social democracy are 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 a minority at this moment uh, in the Senate, and a bare bare majority maybe in the House. In fact, given the number of conservative Democrats in the House, it's probably a minority in both places. Although six of the most liberal House members just voted against the infrastructure package in the, in the House, as opposed to uh, the conservative Democrats. Yes, yes. Um, we have a, a group of um, progressives who are not only progressive, but purist progressives. They haven't learned the art of compromise, and they dream of an, of a kind of empowerment that I, I wish were possible, but that I don't think is possible. You know, purity is a word, now that you've used the word, purity is a word that's that's used a lot on the left as a, as a test for not just political goals or political dreams, but, but for moral solidity of character and Many people on the left are, are subject to a, to a purity test that, that goes through their history and their beliefs with a very fine-tooth comb and, and discards them if anything is found to be impure. It's, it's rather like the, like the Salem witch trials in, 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 in a way, um, maybe not quite as crazy, but, but the, the spirit and the, I think the virulence and the potency is all there. What do you make of that? Yes, it is a, perhaps a, a new phenomena. I don't, I don't know. Um, we all thought that um, Bernie Sanders represented a, exactly the kind of social democracy I was talking about, a, a, a left that had um, popular support. He certainly found a constituency, but he is now not able to lead the constituency. He has turned out to be a real politician, a good, a, a good politician who, who is prepared to make the compromises necessary given the political circumstances, the compromises necessary to move forward. And he finds that many of his followers are, are not, are committed to, um, to a rhetoric and sometimes to uh, policies that quite simply do not command sufficient support in the in the country and uh, require people to uh, maneuver, to think politically and not um, ideologically. But I'm more talking about the issues that that lead to people being canceled. For example, I'm talking about the issues that 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 lead to people being fired, that lead to books being banned on the left that lead to pieces of music not being able to be taught due to their name at a music school in Manhattan. I'm talking about the, the shrinking of acceptance yeah. on parts of the left of ideas that are not deemed acceptable or deemed amenable. And this is a, a major problem. And many people would argue, and many people would argue successfully that the exploitation of these very real things uh, led to the Democrats' absolutely catastrophic uh, night at the beginning of November 2021. Yeah, um, there, there is a phenomenon, especially in, uh, uh, in the academic left at our universities and perhaps most of all at our uh, elite universities, a phenomenon of... Um, left-wing uh, political correctness and absolute intolerance for anyone who uh, expresses any disagreement with the ideologically correct uh, um, position. It may be the case that this, uh, this academic culture leaks into the general culture. Um, perhaps it leaks from universities to high schools, and then we get these, these savage wars in... Um, school board elections um, and school board meetings uh, where um, what high school leftists want to teach is, is, is mostly simply a more accurate picture of American history than, has conventional, than is conventional in um, textbooks. I, I think 
the school board wars, which seem to have had a major impact on the Virginia election, are the creation of um, uh, of Republican lies. But the cancel culture that you're talking about is very real. I'm not sure it has much of an electoral impact. When the democratic socialism of, Amer- of America cancel a lecture by Adolf Reed, who is a good democratic socialist, um, because he prefers to talk about class rather than race. And the current doctrine is that race is what you have to talk about. That is terrible from the standpoint of the left, um, because Reed should be a welcome person to talk with, even if you argue with him, but he should be someone included in um, a big tent left. And to exclude him is, 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 is a crime against the left. I don't think it affects the, uh, the national, it doesn't affect national politics. On the other hand, the, the, poli- the issues around the police, uh, defunding, abolishing the police, that's an issue that I think has been disastrous for the, for the left. Um, and that is an issue where a lot of people on the left um, believe that if you aren't willing to say, def- you aren't willing to use the phrase, then you must be ostracized, banished. Yeah, that's a kind of politics that, uh, that is terribly destructive. I would argue, I, I would push back slightly on, on your idea that perhaps uh, a professor the professor's lecture being canceled wouldn't make its way down, but there's so many instances of that that I think it all goes into the Republican messaging and it all goes into the echo chamber and it all becomes talking points. Look, the Democrats, you know, liberal, liberal Princeton won't even have liberal professor from Columbia talk. That's how dogmatic, that's how crazy the Democrats are getting. It's very easy to turn that into a, into a TV ad, no? Yeah, I think it was um, it was Yale where he couldn't talk. I think he did come to Princeton. Okay, well, sorry, I I, I was I, I meant to just name two generic elite yeah. institutions. No, but. <laughs> I, I I I I agree. This is um, what is that all about, though? Literally, it is as if the left, having failed to seize power in Washington, has seized power in the English department <laughs> or the. <laughs> <laughs> or the politics department at this place or that place. And they are acting like commissars. They are acting as if um, they are in control and they want um, politically correct uh, speakers and only politically correct speakers. Um, <laughs> you know, I grew up on with a magazine called D- Dissent. We, we believed in argument, the, the most... Um, the most widely read feature of the of our quarterly magazine was the section called Arguments, where we um, we presented disagreements, um, serious disagreements on the left. People made arguments and responded to arguments and the and responded to the responses. We had red lines, I guess. We wouldn't have published uh, Stalinists. No, we wouldn't have published Defenders of Stalinism, but we had a wide view of the of the necessity of argument on the left, and somehow that's been lost. What happens to students and campuses when this is the party line, the line of administrators, the line of faculty, the line of of anxious students on social media? What, what does that do to the ability to produce people who are going to be good citizens, civic-minded people who can argue uh, effectively and listen effectively uh, and, and make rational decisions for themselves. It seems, it seems like it's a, a catastrophe. Yes, it is. But how extensive a catastrophe, I, I don't know. I haven't been at a university now in a very long time. The Institute in Princeton is uh, is is isolated it is a genuine ivory tower not a pretend one right (laughs) i i think it has what you're describing has has different effects some students withdraw 
they 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 don't like the the kind of politics that is going on. They don't like the left, but they are not ready for the Trumpist right. They they withdraw from politics, and and some I suppose are um, go along with uh, try to speak the language of this purist left. What the next generation will be like? I'm 86 years old. I'm gonna. I'm. I expect to be surprised if I live long enough to see it. The common thing on the right that that's thrown around a lot is Joe Biden's socialist agenda, and sometimes the word communist comes in too. Obviously, he's not communist, but there's no person better to explain to us. What is what is Joe Biden, and but also what is socialism? What is Joe Biden, and and why is using the word communist so ridiculous? But I think you should address it anyway. <laughs> Joe Biden spent most of his life as a centrist Democrat, a, a, a liberal Democrat, who uh, would have said he believed in uh, the New Deal, but was obviously prepared for the kinds of um, withdrawal uh, from New Deal um, commitments that occurred in the Clinton and Obama administrations. But now, right now, confronted with COVID, confronted with global warming, confronted with the, the extraordinary rise of inequality in, in American society, he has become not a communist, not even a socialist, but what I call the social democrat. His his um, big spending bills, which are not that big, if you consider them as proposals for 10 years of spending, his proposals are good social democratic proposals. They would strengthen the welfare state. They would enable um, government actions um, to deal with climate change. They would create the kind of um, health service that, that we need both now during this uh, COVID pandemic and in, uh, in expectation of future pandemics. That's what he is. That's what he's doing. He has, he has given his past. He has risen to the occasion. But the world or the American politics has not risen with him. What do you say to people who who say, as they do often, well, he's bringing America down a socialist path? It is a path um, toward greater use of um, of collective powers, of state powers, for the sake of of um, of the common good. Yes, that is that is a, that's the right path. I don't think it's going to lead to um, anything like what in Europe is called socialism. It will lead to something more like labor England and or social democratic Sweden. Yeah, I think that is the, the right road. I'm not sure we're actually on it, but it's where we should be. Michael Walter, as you know, this program is called Talking Beats, and we always talk some about music. Um, and uh, everybody has a role that music plays in their lives. What does music do for you? Are you a music lover? And I wonder, in the pandemic, did you hunker down with a good record at home on the stereo? Or you know, there is a um, an, an old Jewish joke. This this guy picks up the phone, and uh, somebody says, "Is this the Rockefeller residence?" And he says, Oy vey, have you got the wrong number? <laughs> so you hate music. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> when I was seven or eight years old, my mother in the Bronx uh, took me to a music teacher, a quite ambitious music teacher. And we started with the piano. Um, and after a few months, she came to my mother and said, it's no good. He's completely tone deaf. Uh, he'll never... Um, He'll never play the piano. He's not going to be Rubenstein or Horowitz. <laughs> or, um, <laughs> yes. So my wife takes me to concerts and I enjoy the concerts, but I couldn't tell you what's going on and I have no musical memory. 
<laughs> do you put on music when you're writing or when you're walking no, around the house? Or? No, no, I don't. I guess the music we have sometimes listened to together would be 1940s jazz. Um, with Dizzy Gillespie or Charlie Parker or even more the vocalists from that period like Ella Fitzgerald or Anita O'Day. That's a music I can enjoy. Me too, and I would throw in Glenn Miller and Tommy Dorsey into that group too. Uh huh. Michael Walzer, uh, when we finish this conversation, uh, what are you going back to work on? What What are you anxious about yourself? I mean, you've articulated a lot, but what are you writing and what are you uh, occupied with right now? I'm I'm actually trying to to finish a book that I that I have named the adjective liberal. The, the argument of the book is that liberalism is, no, is not at this moment in time a, um, a coherent ideological position. Um, in Europe, it's, it mostly means libertarianism. Uh, in America, it means something like social democracy, but it doesn't have a... Um, a clear meaning. And um, I think that the best way to, um, to describe our commitments is with the adjective liberal and then the various nouns. And I explore what it means to be a liberal Democrat, or as I am a liberal social Democrat or socialist, um, a liberal nationalist, um, a liberal uh, professor, <laughs> A liberal, um, my my sister required me to write a, a liberal feminist um, and a liberal Jew. What role does the adjective play? It's a defense of the adjective and, and also of the commitments. Um, the commitment to democracy is a commitment to self-government, majority rule, but liberal democracy is means the majority can't do whatever it wants. There are constraints in the name of individual rights and civil liberties. Socialism is a commitment to equality, but liberal socialism is a, a rejection of the kind of authoritarianism that might be necessary for a radical egalitarian society. That's what I'm trying to write about, what it means to live with the adjective liberal and the various nouns that define my own uh, my own commitments. What are you going to be keeping your eye on in the next few months, fall, winter, spring? What are you going to be looking at politically in this country for either hope or more fear? Well, I'm going to be hoping that the Democrats manage to get some decent legislation through Congress and that the, um, the implementation of uh, the measures that they adopt will be rapid. And I'm also hoping for some commitment to liberalism in the culture, the liberal culture, meaning against the cancel culture, some recognition by the Democrats that for many people, culture trumps politics and that issues like um, schools or police are perhaps even more important than what we can do in the way of child care or um, um, unemployment insurance or protection for small businesses. We, we need to find a way uh, to talk with the people who are not voting with us, to talk to, talk to them. And it, it has to be a way that is um, culturally cautious, <laughs> groping, without the ideological certainty, a certain kind of, of, of openness uh, that is at the moment missing on the left, as you have said. So I'm looking for signs. Will, will Democrats ever get rural voters back? Meaning also the implication there is was white in, in parentheses, but any rural voters, will, will they be back ever? Well, um, I don't know about genuinely rural voters, small towns, um, devastated uh, old industrial towns, 
maybe. You know, I, I grew up in, in after the Bronx in Johnstown, Pennsylvania, which was a steel town. Bethlehem Steel uh, owned the town until the Union came. And then it was a democratic stronghold until the steel industry collapsed and there was a lot of unemployment and young people leaving. And in 2016, Johnstown voted two to one for Trump after being solidly democratic since the, since the 40s when the union came. I think a lot of those people can be won back, can be brought back. Um, if you just pay attention to their life, the crises of their lives, and the resentments that that the the feeling of being left behind um, by the very people who supposedly um, were their allies, the people they voted for abandoned them. We need to find a way of talking to the people of Johnstown and other places like it. That was a small town, seventy thousand people. Yeah, and there are a lot of places like that. Actually, Bernie Sanders succeeded to some degree in talking to those people. And there were a lot of people in the polls who said their first choice was Trump and their second choice was Sanders. I, I remember that. Those were quite extraordinary, those polls. And I, and I ran into people like that. I mean, they really existed. They, I mean, they, they really were quite taken with Bernie Sanders. And people always ask this question, and you can't sort of know, but had Bernie been... The candidate would he have beaten Trump, and and uh, what if had Bernie been the nominee this time? Would he have beaten Trump instead of Biden? Uh, uh, but certainly Bernie connected to people across the political spectrum in a way that I don't think another Democrat has done in ten, twenty years. Right, right. But Bernie would not have won because the fire of the right, the extraordinary. Um, ability to use the media. The fire of the right was directed against Hillary and then against Biden. It was never directed against Bernie. It would have been, they would have talked about his his visit to the to a kibbutz in Israel. They would have talked about his what he said about Cuba in 19 God knows when. He would not have he would not have survived, I don't think. Um, in, in an election against the Republican machine. But he would have lost a lot of middle-class independence. He would have gotten working-class votes that Hillary didn't get. Zoom out for us, if you would. Is What is the promise of America? And is America now living up to its promise and living to its potential? Well, n nobody ever lives to their potential. <laughs> Um, and certainly no political uh, society. America's promise is the promise of, of, of democratic inclusion, of equal citizenship, of um, opportunity. Speaking as, a, as an American Jew, it, it, it is the most hospitable place in the history of the Jewish diaspora. For all the anti-Semitism of, of past and present, it is for Jews, and I think for many other people, a better place than any of the alternatives, um, but certainly not as good a place as it should be, um, and especially not for Blacks, Hispanics uh, at this moment. But look, we are probably, if you just consider race, religion, ethnicity, we are probably the most diverse society in the world. And that brings a lot of problems, but it also is something to be uh, proud of. If more people had some civic pride and, and if more people thought a, a tenth as deeply as you do, I think our society would be a lot better off. But then again, that's why we can go to you. And indeed, Michael Walzer, I thank you very much. Well, thank you. It's been a lovely conversation. You've been listening to Talking Beats with me, Daniel Lalchuk. Don't forget to give us a five-star rating on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts and write a review if you would. That really helps. The original music for this show is by Ronald Markham. The producer is Doug Christian. 
For more information, visit the website of the show, TalkingBeats.com. Thank you for listening. This is Talking Beats with Daniel Lalchuk.